Hi, Pastor Steve here. I want to thank you for listening today, and I want to encourage you because I know that God will truly bless you as you study His Word. So hey, let's get started. Welcome to Lawrence Heights this morning. We're glad that you guys are here with us. Will you stand up and put your hands together if you want? We're going to sing together. This is called House of the Lord. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. Won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. As He hung up on that cross. He rose up from the grave My God still rolling stones away There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today and we won't be quiet We shout out your grace There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place We won't be quiet Forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house Shout out your grace, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your grace, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your grace. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Surely my God is 
the strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. Your love defends me. Your love defends me, your love defends me, and when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me, your love defends me. Let's give it up this morning, right? Let's sing this. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with me. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Summer and winter and springtime and Sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Beginning to One. 
Good morning, everybody. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, I gave a, a meditation on the fact that God used the high priest of the temple to offer up Jesus as our sacrificial lamb and how it had to be done that way in order to fulfill the Old Testament law. As I said in that meditation, they were the priests, he was the lamb, the sacrifice. They had to be the ones to initiate his death. That was their ministry and their calling. And under the law, only they could deliver the Lamb of God to his death. Just to let you know, uh, that's just one prophecy fulfilled out of 351 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled literally in the New Testament. Uh, no, I'm not going to give a communion meditation on, on all 351 of those prophecies. Uh, but I could, but I don't think Steve would appreciate me taking the rest of the day. So uh, remember that Jesus said in Matthew 5.17, Do not presume that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And he has done that. Today, though, I do want to kind of build on that meditation from two weeks ago, just to show how amazing our God truly is, how he fulfills all of his plans down to the very letter of his law. You see, God also knew that there were certain requirements in the law that defined what lambs could be used as a sacrifice. And in the writings of the ancient rabbis, it's also recorded the only place where they could shepherd flocks was in the wilderness, which is far outside of the cities, except for those of the flocks or lambs that were specifically appointed or destined to be for the temple sacrifices, the sacrificial lambs. These needed to be kept in close proximity to the temple, to Jerusalem. Well, in the days of the birth of Jesus, there was one particular region of Israel that was not part of the wilderness, but of the hills and valleys conducive for sheep and known for its flocks and its shepherds. And it happened to be in very close proximity to Jerusalem, where the temple was. What was this region called? Bethlehem. Isn't that amazing? Why is that amazing? Because we know where Jesus was born. Jesus, our sacrificial lamb, was born in Bethlehem. 
the Lamb of God was born in the same place where all the sacrificial lambs had to be born. The very lambs destined to be offered up in the temple as sacrifices to cover the sins of men. That's also the reason why the first ones to see Jesus in this world were the shepherds. I'd never understood that till I really researched this. Because when a lamb for a sacrifice was born, the shepherds were expected to attend its birth. Why? Because they would grade the lamb. You know, they, they you know, had to be a pure lamb. Uh, no blemishes, no defects. So these were not just shepherds. They were the same shepherds that did that for all the sacrificial lambs, the ones who attended the birth of all sacrificial lambs. So once again, we see the mystery of God was there from the very beginning, from Jesus' birth. The entire purpose of Jesus' life was to give himself, to give his life as a gift of sacrificial love for each one of us. His entire life, even from the moment of his birth, was all about love. Just as God had a plan for the life of Jesus, his son, he also has a plan for each one of us this morning. He loves every one of us, and he, has, and he is never going to, ne he never leaves us in our times of distress. Instead, he's there to strengthen and encourage us. I will say again that if you are one of his, he has truly worked all things in your life together for good. We do not always recognize this at the time, but I pray that you all will recognize that he is going to do the same thing for you in your lives today. We need to give him all of our praise for, he, for the way that he loves each and every one of us and gave himself for us. Here at Lawrence Heights Christian Church, we do celebrate open communion, which means that if you have accepted him into your heart as your Lord and Savior and believe that he died so that you might have everlasting life, then we invite you to participate with us in this communion service. The servers will be coming and present you with a tray that has two cups stacked, one on top of the other, one with the bread on the bottom and the one on the top with the juice. These emblems were also prepared with the utmost love and care for your protection. Let us pray. Father, once again, I want to thank you for your goodness and mercy that you shower on all of us throughout our lives. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, the Comforter, who is there for us throughout our tragedies and sorrows, as well as in our victories. Help all of us to turn our hearts and lives over to you and to acknowledge that all of us are included in Paul's prayer in Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Your love truly, or you truly love each one of us so deeply, Lord. Teach us to love you just as deeply as you love us. Amen.
sing this together. so, so kind to me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow.
be seated. Amen is right. Hey, before they get very far, let's show our appreciation again for our praise team leading us in worship today. Amen. Amen. And once again, good morning to you, church. It's so good to see you and be here worshiping the Lord with you today. And for everybody who is watching or listening online, we want to welcome you as well. And if you happen to be new around here, maybe even visiting for the very first time, listen, we are so glad that you're here. You need to know that this is a place where you can belong and use your talents to glorify Christ. So we invite you to just plug right in and connect. In fact, the best way to get the whole process started can be found inside your bulletin. Hopefully you grabbed one of these on your way in. Inside, please find that little tear-off connections card there on the side. We'd love to know that you are here today and how we can best meet your ministry needs and partner with you in prayer. You could just fill out a little bit of information there, tear it right out, and then you can leave it back there in the back of the offering box on your way out. Now, we are starting a brand new sermon series today. So if you've got your Bible nearby or your Bible app, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and make your way to John chapter 4 so you can follow along with us. This is going to be a topical series rather than our usual verse-by-verse study of a particular book of the Bible. We're going to be jumping into a new book study soon and very soon, I assure you. But between now and then, I'm going to ask you to just pray with me and consider the question, what would happen if God awakened his church. I really wanted to title this series, Wake Up Church, because my prayer is that the church would unify and begin to speak with one voice and get back to the mission that God has us on so we can watch him do a great work in this particular season. Anyway, that's my heart, and I hope that you'll join me in this journey. Now, before we dig into God's word today, I just want to thank you for participating in the product drive to bless Family Promise here in town. If you didn't know, Family Promise is a special ministry partner of ours, and they focus specifically on helping homeless families not just secure housing, but also to grow together and thrive together as a family. All month long in the month of February, we're going to be collecting those much-needed items out there in the foyer as well as committing to partnering and lifting them in prayer. It's just a wonderful example of what God can do when we're working together in unity. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, with God's word open before us, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask him to prepare our hearts and our minds to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Jesus said that there is no greater love for us than to lay down our lives for our friends. But sadly, far too often in the church, we say we're willing to do that, but our actions betray us. So Lord, help us to take our eyes off of ourselves and off of our circumstances. Help us to train our attention on you and you alone. God, please mold us and shape us in this specific time of equipping. And then tune us and play us as your instruments in your hand. As Jesus prayed, Father, make us one just like he and you are one, so that the whole world would know. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. And together in unity, the church said, amen. 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 Well, this past week, I heard a fascinating story. About 10 years ago, researchers put 40 moms and 40 babies together, and they studied the way that each mom connected with their infant child. Whenever they'd be so close to each other, gazing into each other's eyes, mysteriously, the baby and the mother's heartbeat began to beat in perfect rhythm within milliseconds of each other. That's the kind of connection that they had, two hearts beating as one. It's just one of those things that kind of blow your mind when you stop to think about it. I mean, how can two people be so connected that their hearts beat together? Researchers couldn't explain it, but we know that God has wired us to be connected, not just to each other, but to him. So what would happen if our hearts beat in sync with God's heart? What would happen if what broke his heart broke our hearts, or what gave him great joy gave us great joy as well? The Bible's full of these verses that talk about having a heart after God's heart. Remember, God picked David, the king, because he was a man after God's own heart. In the book of Ezekiel, God says, I will take these people's heart of stone and I'll turn it into a heart of flesh. 
In the book of Jeremiah, he said he wanted to give them leaders who would have a heart after his own heart so that he, they would lead the people as he himself would lead them. Then you'll find no greater example of somebody who walked with God's own heart than Jesus himself, the Father and the Son. As Jesus walked the earth, his heart beat in sync with the heart of his Father. In fact, if you wanted to know what God was like, you just looked at Jesus. So in our time together today, we're going to see the heartbeat of Jesus as he goes after one woman who's in such desperate need of redemption. Now, if you're new to the Bible or new as a Christian, this is one of the most powerful stories of God going after one person who's thirsty. You see, in John chapter 4, verse 4, we read this interesting statement. Do you see it there? It says, now he, meaning Jesus, had to go through Samaria. Now, what does it mean, he had to go through Samaria? Well, sandwiched in between Judea in the south and Galilee in the north was this region called Samaria. And listen, no self-respecting Jew would ever go through that neighborhood, even though it was the shortest, most direct route. No Jew would ever do that. In fact, they would go clear around. Why? Well, centuries of hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans, mistrust, It wasn't safe to go through Samaria, and it would create some really uncomfortable conversations. In fact, Jews weren't allowed to eat with the Samaritans or go into their homes or stay in their hotels. So that's why they would walk all the way around. But John records that Jesus had to go through. In fact, he was going to take his disciples through this very uncomfortable space together, all because there was one woman there who was thirsty, one woman who he had an appointment with. Now listen, here's the cool thing about God. Every single day, he has appointments that he wants to keep. In fact, he might even have an appointment with you here today. You don't even know that that appointment is about to happen. Sometimes you don't even know until after the fact. But listen, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, then you're in a great place because God might have an appointment for you today. He may speak to you in a way that totally changes everything. So listen, I'm really glad that you're here today. Now, Watch what Jesus does as he meets this woman at the well in Samaria. Take a look at verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How could you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Okay, so what's happening here in this story that John is telling? Well, again, Jesus has to go through Samaria. And he goes straight to this well, and he waits there as the disciples go into the town to buy some food. And now a woman comes out, and according to verse 6, this was all happening at noon. Now, why is that important? Well, typically, women would go to the well either very early in the morning or late in the evening when it was cooler in the day. It was also a very social thing for them to do. So you would never, ever find a woman at the well all by herself, and you would certainly never find the woman there in the heat of the day. So that tells us a lot about this woman in particular. It tells us that she was an outcast to her own people. But Jesus doesn't come here to lord it over her as the mighty son of God who's come to correct her behavior. No, instead, he does something really interesting. He makes himself dependent upon her. Think that through. The very same God who made water had made himself thirsty. He lowers himself and he asks her, hey, could you give me some water? You see, he puts himself in a dependent position there. 
Now, at first, this woman is shocked because, first of all, hey, we shouldn't be talking. I mean, I'm a woman and you're a man, and not only that, but you're a Jewish man and I'm a Samaritan. I mean, don't you know that that's not how we do it around here? Except Jesus doesn't really care how you do it around here, right? He was always breaking all those cultural norms where people would say, oh, you can't do this or you can't do that or you can't talk to those people. And Jesus was always like, really? Why not? So Jesus is going to have this conversation. As he was thirsty for physical water, he knows that this woman was thirsty for something so much deeper. There's a thirst in her soul. And he offers her living water that will lead to eternal life. And we're going to see him do this so gently and so humbly, but also so directly. Take a look at verse 16. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Wow, he just comes right out and says it, doesn't he? This is what you would call an awkward moment, right? Jesus is creating a very awkward moment. And at first glance, you might think, man, that's so cruel. I mean, it looks like Jesus is just being straight up mean here. I mean, he's talking about eternal life. He's describing for her what what she can do to actually quench her thirst. But then he says, go call your husband. Obviously, he knows that she doesn't have a husband. In fact, she's had five husbands, and the person that she's living with now is not her husband. What's he doing there? Jesus is putting his finger right there on the deepest pain, the deepest disappointment, and the deepest shame in this woman's life, which is, again, why she's at the well there all by herself. Like this is a woman who, when she walks through the town, the other women would grab their husbands and pull them close and say, no, 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 you stay away from her. She feels that shame. She's gone back to the proverbial well over and over and over again, trying to find satisfaction in a man, only to find a deeper sense of disappointment every single time. She desperately wants to be known and to be fully loved and not be rejected. That's the cry of every human soul, to belong and to know that people aren't going to leave you or abandon you. So why would Jesus do that? Why would he put his finger right there on the pain? It's because anything less wouldn't lead to the transformation that she needs. You see, when Jesus puts his finger on the deepest shame or pain or disappointment or fear or longing that you have, he actually wants to heal it and bring transformation to it. So he creates this really awkward moment in order to stir her out of all the pleasantries and the niceties of surface conversations. He's going deeper. He's going after her heart. Now, for us, 2,000 years later, let me just ask, do you know what it's like to go to the wrong well to try to find satisfaction? Anybody here want to admit that they've looked for love in all the wrong places before? Yeah. I don't know how many times I've heard it over the years. I'll hear a woman in particular say, you know what I need, Pastor Steve? Man, I need a man. That's what I need. Ladies, let me just tell you that a man's not going to bring you satisfaction. I'm so sorry. He's just not. If you're married here today, you know that to be true, right? At best, he might add to that satisfaction. But make no mistake, the deep satisfaction of the human soul is not going to be met by a husband or a wife or by having more money or by getting some degree, or by buying a bigger house. No, you see, the deep satisfaction that we're longing for is something that only God can fill. It's a thirst that only he can quench. I mean, think through this with me. If you pull a bucket up from the wrong well, it doesn't matter what's in the bucket. It's still not going to satisfy. So Jesus creates this awkward moment here because he's going after this woman's heart. Now, what was her response? Well, Take a look at verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Wow, she's Captain Obvious here, is she not? Obviously, they don't know each other, but he's told her all about her life. Now, let me just ask, what do you typically do when somebody brings up something really awkward or uncomfortable in your own life? What do you do? Well, most of us, we try to change the subject, don't we? Which is exactly what she's going to do here. She's going to change lanes without signaling. In verse 19, she says, Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. And then notice the abrupt change in verse 20. She says, 
our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Verse 21, Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, verse 26, I who speak to you am he. Now listen, this is the very first time the first person to whom Jesus would announce that he is in fact the Messiah, that I am he. Actually, when you look at the original Greek, he doesn't say I am he, he just says I am. The Messiah, I am. And John is famous for using that two-word phrase whenever he's describing Jesus. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's actually the name of God. The unspeakable name of God in the Old Testament was I am who I am. I'm the God who was and is and is to come. So Jesus tells this woman, the Messiah that you're looking for, the Messiah that you're longing for, I am. But in order to get to that point, I want you to notice that Jesus didn't take the bait. Did you see it there? You know, typically when you're having a difficult conversation about things like the soul, what do people do? They oftentimes throw up a lot of distractions and arguments and defense mechanisms that are just designed to get you off course. Just look at what this woman has thrown at Jesus, all in an attempt to try to get away from this very uncomfortable conversation about her spiritual thirst. What does she do? She brings up gender. She brings up race. Then she brings up politics and religion. Now, aren't you glad that we never do stuff like that today? But again, Jesus doesn't take the bait. We could learn a lot from his example, couldn't we? In fact, when you think about it, Jesus didn't even argue with the devil when he was tempting Jesus in the wilderness. When the devil said, if you're the son of God, turn that stone into bread and jump off the temple and God will save you. Jesus didn't argue with him. No, instead he just simply said, you know, it is written. There's something so powerful about not falling for the bait and arguing when a soul is on the line. And when there's this spiritual thirst that transcends gender and race and politics and religion. The Bible gives us clear instructions as Christians. 2 Timothy 2, 23 and Titus 3, 9 say, Christian, don't get involved in foolish and stupid arguments that just distract people from coming to repentance and the grace of God that will save their soul in the end. God's servants should not quarrel, but kindly instruct people to repentance. Jesus doesn't avoid the difficult conversation at all. He just does it with such a deep kindness. Now, Many of you know that there's an online TV series called The Chosen that my wife and I just love so much. In fact, some of you know this, some of you may not, but we're actually planning to appear as extras in the filming of this upcoming season coming up in May. That's why, that's the whole reason why I'm growing this awful gray beard that you see right now. But one of the things I love most about the show is how Jesus speaks so kindly in very, even in very challenging and stressful situations. In just a moment, I'm going to show you a clip, and I want you to to watch it. I want you to use your imagination to see what this conversation must have been like back at the well. Notice the kindness of Jesus as he both pushes back and as he challenges this woman to quench her spiritual thirst. Take a look at the screen. Do you believe what I'm telling you? Until the Messiah comes and explains everything and sorts this mess out, including me, I don't trust in anyone. You're wrong when you say that you've never received anything from God. This Messiah you speak of, I am he. The first one was named Ramin. You were a woman of purity was excited to be married, but he wasn't a good man. 
He hurt you. And it made you question marriage. And even the practice of your faith. Stop it. The second was Farzad. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And to this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel guilty for leaving him. Because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy. Why are you doing this? I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. You picked the wrong person. I came to Samaria just to meet you. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that I'm, I'm here in the middle of the day? I am rejected by others. I know. But not by the Messiah. <sighs> and you know these things because you are the Christ. I'm going to tell everyone. <laughs> I was counting on it. <laughs> Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It won't be all about mountains or temple. Soon, just the heart. <laughs> you promise? I promise. This man told me everything I've done. Oh, he must be the Christ! <laughs> Now listen, if you're not watching that show, you need to start. I promise that you will fall in love with Jesus in a whole new way. I mean, what does it tell you about the heart of God that he would go after a woman like that first? She became the first evangelist for the gospel because she ran back to the city and told everybody that she had met the Messiah. And now the entire village is going to come back out to that well because her heart is now beating in sync with God's heart. Her first response was, you picked the wrong person. Listen, I'm all messed up. I, I've done so many wrong things. I've made so many mistakes. But listen, if you here today have ever thought like that, like, yeah, Steve, God, there's no way he can use me. I, I don't even think he can save me. I, I really don't know why he even tolerates me. Listen, if you're wondering why God would pick somebody like you, it's simply because he wanted to. It's an act of his grace. It's an act of his love. It has absolutely nothing to do with anything you've done right or wrong. Everybody's invited. That's the beauty of God's heart coming after us. Amen? I know I'm grateful for the grace of God. Second chance, third chance, fourth chance. This is going to be this woman's seventh chance. But because her heart's beating in sync with God's heart now, John tells us that she just left the water jar right there and just totally ran back to the town. And she's telling people, hey, I want you to come meet a man who told me everything that I've ever done, which I'm guessing would have made several of the guys there in town quite nervous in that moment, right? What people gossiped about her, her shame was the very thing that made them follow her back out. Meanwhile, she runs past the disciples who were wondering why Jesus was even speaking to the woman at the well all by himself in the first place. Because, again, men don't talk to women. And Samaritans don't talk to Jews, but they don't even ask, do they? Because they're just so freaked out. And so she runs past them, heading back into the town. And look what happens next in verse 31. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him some food? My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The disciples have no idea what's gone on here. They just caught the tail end of that conversation as the woman ran back into the city. Remember, they had gone into the city to buy some food. So they come back and they say, um, Jesus, are you, are you hungry? Now, I want you to know something really cool about Jesus. Jesus is a foodie. Jesus loves food. In fact, he's the one who created food. And he created your taste buds. 
How many times in the Gospels do we see Jesus at a party? People would even accuse him of being a glutton, all because he loved a good party and he loved good food. He tells us here what his favorite food is. His favorite food, Jesus says, is the one that gives him the most joy and the most satisfaction. He says it's to do the will of his Father. So do you know what that means Jesus' favorite food was? Jesus' favorite food was soul food, right? Oh, come on, that's good. <laughs> Give me a break. Have you ever been in a place where you were so into whatever God was doing, or your heart was beating in rhythm with his heart so much so that you actually forgot to eat? That's what's happening here with Jesus. This God-man Messiah who loves food so much is doing something that brings him an even deeper level of satisfaction, more joy than any meal that he's ever eaten. So he tells his disciples, nobody brought me any food. I'm just doing the will of my Father. And that's what happens when your heart starts to beat in sync with God's heart. You go after somebody who everybody else has rejected and given up on, and you gladly skip a meal to do so. Or if you're that woman who was so filled with shame, what do you do? You sprint back to those people and you say, but you can be forgiven as well. In fact, your deepest thirst can be quenched if you'll just come to know Jesus. Then verse 35, Jesus says, do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Now, what we see here is Jesus is having this conversation about food, and the woman is back in the town telling people, hey, come see the person who told me everything that I ever did. He's the Messiah. But now, Jesus here, he's looking out over the field. Some of your Bibles, depending on the translation you have, it might say that the fields are white with harvest. You've heard that phrase before. But if you look at what's happening there in Samaria, they grew barley and grain, which went from green to brown. So he's not talking about the physical harvest here, just like he wasn't talking about physical food. No, what's happening here is that the men of Samaria who traditionally wore white robes, they're now flocking out of the city toward the disciples. In fact, it looks like a sea of people wearing white robes heading their way. In other words, Jesus was reframing the disciples' view of the city here. They were just in the city. Remember, they didn't want to go there in the first place. They just wanted to go get some lunch, don't talk to anybody, then quickly get out, which is exactly what they did. But Jesus is telling them, guys, listen, look, the mission that we're on is the city. Jesus is going to reorient their hearts and their minds and just so that they can start beating in sync with his. He says, guys, open your eyes and look. The mission is right in front of you. Open your eyes and see. You note-takers have been waiting ever so patiently today. Feel free to write it down this way. It's a simple idea. Point number one there in your notes. The city is where the harvest is. The very same mission that Jesus had for them is the same mission that he has for us. Listen, the city is where the harvest is. Jesus says to his, his disciples, open your eyes and look. The field is white with harvest. What happens next? Well, all these men and women come out and they have a conversation with Jesus. And they invite Jesus and the disciples back into the city where they spend two full days and nights in the very city that they didn't want to be in. Staying at the Samaritan Econo Lodge, eating at the Samaritan Kentucky Fried Chicken, hanging out with people that weren't their people in a neighborhood that they shouldn't be in. Verse 39 says that many Samaritans believed because of the woman's testimony and because they heard from Jesus himself. Listen, this is the very first revival ever recorded in Jesus' ministry in a town that most Jewish people just simply avoided altogether. Jesus is realigning the disciples' hearts and minds to the mission, and now their hearts are beginning to beat in rhythm with his. Now, why does Jesus love the people of this city so much? Why? Well, when you look back throughout Scripture, you see God loved a pagan place called Nineveh. So much so that he sent a prophet named Jonah who was very reluctant to save the people of that city. God loved the kingdom and nation of Babylon so much so that he allowed Daniel to be taken captive from his hometown just so that a man named Nebuchadnezzar could be reached and the good news could go to the whole world. 
God used an orphan named Esther because he loved a king and a people in Persia who needed to know that there's a God who was and is and is to come and that he wanted to have a relationship with him. Listen, when you actually see Jesus as king, you'll start to see your own city very differently. Do you have any idea why God loves Lawrence, Kansas so much or the town that you live in? He loves the city so much so that he's sending you, that's how much, And he's saying, listen, open up your eyes and look. I don't know if you ever thought about this before, but you don't live where you live because of some job that you have or because of the tropical weather that we enjoy year-round here in Kansas. No, there's a mission right in front of you. In fact, in Acts chapter 17, verses 26 and 27, the apostle Paul said that God determined the exact time and place where you would live so that people around you would seek God and that they would know him. Have you ever thought about that before? Think about how intentional God is. You don't live where you live by accident, nor do you live in this time in history by accident. God has determined it all so that your neighbors will know that he's not far from them, from any one of them, at any time. And that same thirst that God has quenched in you, if your heart is beating with his heart, well, then you'll want to share it with them. We are ambassadors of God, making his appeal through us for people to be reconciled to God as they find forgiveness in Jesus and the hope of eternal life. We need to recognize the fact that the Christian faith isn't just relegated to an hour and a half here on Sunday mornings, or even in the way that you serve in the church or give to the church, or even some outreach effort that you might participate in once or twice a year. Listen, that's all great, but the most powerful opportunity that the church has to wake up to is for every one of us to recognize that our mission field is right in front of us. God loves our city. His heart is beating for every man, woman, and child to know his love for them. So what would happen if we realized that Jesus was sending us to the city? In fact, I'm going to ask you to write it down that way. It's a simple idea. Point number two there in your notes. Jesus is sending you to the city. Jesus is sending you and me. He's sending us to the city, just like he sent that woman to the city, just like he sent the disciples into the city. Again, he's sending us. The fields are ready for harvest right there in front of you. You just need to look up and see. Church, wake up and see. You know, when I think of this idea of waking up, I think of this line in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14, where Paul is talking about Christians living as children of the light, in a world of darkness. And it's interesting because he quotes another line, and typically whenever you see quotation marks in the New Testament, it's usually citing an Old Testament scripture, but that's not the case here. That's not the case with Ephesians 5, verse 14. Scholars tell us that it's actually a song of the New Testament church. You can read it there on the screen. This is Paul talking to the church, and he says, this is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Stop and think about what was happening at the time that this was written. One of the early songs of the church was a song in which they would actually sing those words, God, wake us up, shine your light on us so that we could live this resurrected life. That song was sung at a time where people were actually killing Christians and taking their property and ridiculing them. So it wasn't an easy time to be a Christian at all. And you would think back in that day that all the Christians would be fully awake to the fact that their city was their mission field. And yet they still sang this song to remind them that they wanted their hearts to be beating in sync with God's heart. That every enemy was a potential friend and brother and sister in Christ. That every opposition wasn't stronger than the strength of God himself. And that Jesus was going after the one through them. You see, so many times when we think about the church today, we think of of the group of people maybe just gathered here in this room on Sunday mornings. We think of us as being an audience. In fact, we use words like congregation, right? You've heard me say this before. I'll say it again. You are not an audience at all. You are an army. You're the people of God, a royal priesthood, ambassadors of the most important message that ever could ever be told that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came into the world to save sinners, and that he saved you, and he saved me, and he could save them too. Amen? Amen. So imagine with me, what would happen if we woke up to the idea that if revival is going to happen, 
if the gospel is actually going to penetrate our city, then each of us need to start seeing every single person in front of us as somebody who is made in the very image of God. Every person where you work or in your school or at the gym where you work out or even that person who cut you off in traffic, that's a person who's made in the very image of God. That's a person who's spiritually thirsty even if they can't put their finger on it. So first, just start out by seeing them. Just see them. And then start thinking about how you can share with them. Listen, serving people is the first step in saving people. And you don't have to be like them. Yeah, Steve, you don't understand. I mean, my boss, my boss is the devil. No, your boss is not the devil, okay? I mean, they may be influenced by the devil, but they're certainly not the devil. And you don't have to be like them in order to save them. But listen, you do have to like them in order for them to recognize that there's something different in your life. Again, you don't have to be like them, but you have to like them and begin to pray for them because people can tell whether you genuinely like them or not. So imagine what would happen if every Christian began to pray for people in their lives, God, please help me to like this person. I don't know if you realize how low the bar is right now for somebody to stand out in today's culture. The bar is so low right now that if you're just kind to people, well, you will really stand out. Something simple like opening a door for somebody or saying, hey, can I buy you lunch? I mean, if you're just kind, polite, thoughtful, and listen and ask questions that aren't about you, well, listen, you'll stick out like a sore thumb. Listen, it doesn't matter what you do for a living. Doctor, lawyer, teacher, stay-at-home mom, business leader, entrepreneur, server. Listen, as a Christian, it doesn't matter what you do. What matters is why you do it. You're supposed to do it as an act of worship. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. So don't fall for the trap of making every conversation or argument about race or politics or gender, or religion. Because you know that a soul is at stake and your heart is beating with the very heart of God. Again, church, don't fall for the trap. In fact, I just want to challenge you to pray this simple daily prayer. Like over the next month, I want to challenge you to pray, God, please show me somebody today who I can share your love with. That's a simple prayer. God, open my eyes. God, wake me up. Show me one person that I can share your love with. Can you imagine if each of us prayed this prayer every day? What would happen? He might just put somebody in your heart where you just maybe shoot him a simple text saying, hey, I'm thinking about you today. I know you had a rough week. I'm praying for you. It could be an invitation to lunch. Hey, let me buy you lunch. Tell me your story. It could be a simple word of encouragement. Hey, you know, the presentation that you did in front of the class, it was actually the best presentation of them all. You have a gift. It doesn't matter who they voted for in the last election or what their religious affiliation is. You're moving past those defense mechanisms with a kindness and a care and a love. God, please show me that one person who I can share your love with. You know, again, your Christian faith isn't just about this little holy huddle here on Sunday mornings. Matter of fact, as you leave the parking lot here today, you're going to see a sign that says you are now entering the mission field. I want you to look for it. And I want you to put your hand on your heart and just ask God, God, is my heart beating in sync with your heart? Do the things that break your heart break my heart? Do the things that give you joy give me joy as well? If we prayed that prayer in unity as one church, then and only then will we experience a revival and the glory of God as he uses us as his instruments to reach the world in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's close in prayer together. Father God, we ask you to do above and beyond what we could do in our own feeble efforts. Sometimes we can't even believe that you picked us, but you did. Thank you for that act of grace, for drawing us, for saving us, now for sending us out on a mission. Help us to be awakened to the possibilities that are all around us. Realign our hearts, God, 
Help us to embrace being part of an army rather than just being part of an audience. And not to be spiritual consumers, but spiritual contributors. Men and women who step into uncomfortable spaces and have uncomfortable conversations and maybe even say the wrong things on occasion. Help us to allow you to give us wisdom and kindness and thoughtfulness for everyone we come in contact with. And at the end of it all, we ask you to pour out your spirit in fresh ways in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, sometimes you have an appointment with God and you don't even know it. And I know that's true for somebody here today. God has lined up all the circumstances of your life in order for there to be this moment right now where you sense a hunger or a thirst or a spiritual need in your life. And to you, I just want to ask a simple question. It's a question that's asked all throughout the Bible. Are you thirsty? In the deepest part of your heart, are you thirsty in such a way that you've tried Everything you tried has not been able to quench that thirst. No relationship, no amount of money or success, nothing that you've done has been able to touch that thirst. Listen, if that describes you today, then I've got some really good news. Jesus can quench that thirst. He's offering living water to you today, just like he offered this woman at the well in our story, just like he's offered me and so many others here today. But listen, make no mistake, he won't force you to take a drink. Instead, he'll just keep asking, are you thirsty? If so, then he says, come to me. And here's your opportunity. In a moment, we're going to sing a song. That's going to be your cue to come forward. That's the first step. Because a relationship with Jesus changes everything from the inside out. Really, for any need you might have this morning, I would love to just pray with you. So please come forward as we stand and sing now. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart. my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. My chains are i 
week. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks for being here. Thanks again for listening today. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like more information about our church or if you just want to share what God's been doing in your life, drop us a line. Give us a call. Again, may God bless you.